Our fourth speaker is Professor Michael Wormington. Professor Wormington is an associate professor and associate chair of the biology department. He holds a BA and PhD from the University of Kansas and completed postdoctoral research as an NH fellow at the Carnegie Institute of Science. Professor Wormington's primary research interests lie in the regulation of microRNA processing and function during oogenesis and embryogenesis. You'll have to bear with me, I don't do science. <laughs> <laughs> he is a distinguished professor of cell biology. <laughs> professor Wormington holds many accolades for his excellence in his research and teaching, such as the March of Dimes Birth Defects Foundation New Investigator Award, multiple distinguished teaching awards from UVA's Department of Biology, and the university's prestigious all-university teaching award. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Michael Wormington. Thank you. Um, I have to confess, uh, with all due respect to my colleagues, I've got the toughest act to follow tonight. <laughs> so please take that into account. I also have to admit that I'm uh, definitely conflicted speaking tonight because, as um, you heard, I'm an alum at the University of Kansas. And for the first time in the 25 years I've been at the University of Virginia, UVA's basketball team is ranked higher than Kansas. Wow. <laughs> as I said, I'm conflicted. <laughs> so one of the longest standing questions underlying contemporary biology is how did we get where we are today and by that I'm referring to our bodies or more precisely the cells of, that comprise our bodies and we all know that I mean even a non-science major knows we all came from a fertilized day okay it's not that profound but there's a complementary question that goes along with that that's even more challenging and that is biologically can we go back in time can we go back from where we came from do we get to have a cellular do-over, so to speak? And this is at the heart of contemporary research in stem cell biology. And this is a field where ideas become reality as quickly as you can think of them. And advances are continually outpacing regulations, policy, religion, theology, and ethics. And there's not so much about should we do this research that I want you to understand is that it's being done, it's going to continue being done, and instead the question is how do we grasp the implications of what we're going to do with it. And at the outset, I have to admit that most scientists have a terrible track record when it comes to predicting the future. Um, we do a terrible job overestimating how long it will take the most challenging problems to be solved. They always get solved quicker than we think. And at the same time, we underestimate how long it's going to take to do the straightforward things. That's what always takes longer. So take what I say with the proverbial grain of salt here. So to start off, I just want to give you a quick review of stem cell biology and what makes a stem cell unique. And it comes down to this, is that they have a unique capability, unlike all of our other cells, that they can do one of two things at the very moment after they divide. And that is, the cell can keep the game going. It's a process called self-renewal. And that is one of the two cells of division can keep the process going. That is, these cells can continue to proliferate. The other cell, though, is going to go down a fate or a map, so to, or a trip, so to speak, that's ultimately going to allow that cell to differentiate into any of a number of different specialized cell types. We call that potential. You're going to see the word potential here used a lot. So the simplest question are those cells up there that undergo self-renewal. Well, here's a conundrum. They don't do it all the time, or they shouldn't do it all the time. And in fact, some of our cells are tucked away in little nicks and um, niches that are actually referred to as crypts. And that's where they hang out until the right signal comes along and says, wake up and get going again. But if you take a look at self-renewal, it's a balancing act. And the balancing act is that, is if our stem cells don't renew themselves, well, it's part of what contributes to aging. Uh, those of us that lose our hair, it's because the stem cells that line our hair follicles, they gave up the ghost, they quit dividing, we go bald, we age. Ultimately, we will die. The other side, though, of the balance is just as precarious, and that's cancer. And that is, if we don't control the ability of self-renewal, so if these cells keep going indefinitely, then that's cancer. 
So at the outset, one of the ideas that we can see is because if you have a fade there, proliferate or differentiate, that is, show your potential, that perhaps new avenues of cancer research are going to actually work by somehow taking cancer cells and recognizing the extraordinary similarity between stem cells and cancer cells to basically get the cancer cells to perhaps, in response to a drug or to a small molecule, they'll go back and actually differentiate and go down a path where they're not going to continue proliferating. So, continuing the lesson on stem cells, they're not all created equal, okay? They basically come in serial gradations. And in fact, the other way that I could show this slide would be to illustrate what happens to first year undergraduates when they come to the university. <laughs> you start off, you're very broad. You have unlimited potential. You're totipotent. You are the fertilized egg of academics. <laughs> you start taking courses. You start declaring a major. You start specializing. And look what happens. You start losing the ability for self-renewal. You start losing your ability for potency. You become specialized. And you walk out of here in four years, and you're very, very specialized. But here's the key. Is that really a unidirectional process? Is it only one direction? Can we only go in that one way? And that is, if we take a look at it, if we go down, we can sort of look at our development as a human being as having more and more and more restricted restrictions on what we can be. You notice that we have all sorts of populations of stem cells in the adult body. That's fine. But they're very specialized, and they can only do a few things. Okay, well, the problem is, what if we want to be able to do things on a little bit grander scale, a little bit broader? Well, then what we would have to do is to be able to go back. Now, adult stem cells can, in fact, be used for a number of treatments and therapies. You notice that the most common one that you would have would be bone marrow transplants. Well, what you're basically doing is putting in stem cells that arrive from that tissue to basically use it to treat, for example, certain types of leukemia or lymphoma or anemias. Okay, so the problem that we have here is that stem cell research is very pragmatic. Why don't we just take what we have in the adult cell and use it? Well, the problem is this, is that the only option? Wouldn't it be nice if we could go back and try and develop stem cell therapies that could take advantage of the slightly greater potential that we would have back when we were an egg and back when we were an embryo? And that is, can we kick ourselves and make them go back in time? Can we make them de-differentiate? Can we make them go back? That is a big question. That is, can we reverse this process? And the work that started this was actually recognized two years ago in the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine by two investigators. The first is John Gurdon, a British scientist, who actually was the first to basically develop the process of somatic cell nuclear transfer. John Gurdon was one of the first individuals to clone an animal. He did it in the 1960s, 50 years ago. So there's nothing new here. But Gurdon came up with the idea that we could take a cell, very specialized, put it into an egg, and we could reprogram development. That's pretty profound. He did the experiment and showed it could go back. Shinya Yamanaka, in the early 2000s, showed that we don't have to use the egg. The egg has the capacity to recapitulate all of development. So that means everything we need is there to do this process. If we spend enough time and go through and dissect it, we can figure out and calculate what it is that's needed to reprogram cells. Yamanaka took the opposite approach, and that is take a minimalistic change and try and find what are the minimal components or genes that we can take, add it to an adult cell, and get it to convert back to being an embryonic stem cell. So both of these were major intellectual breakthroughs in the idea that showed that, in fact, we can reverse the ability of our cells to be specialized. <laughs> If we take a look at what nuclear transfer, somatic cell nuclear transfer has, it has the potential of taking an adult nucleus and reprogramming it, but you can see there's two issues here. One is, is that the fact you have to put that cell into an egg. That means you have to have a source of eggs to use for these experiments. The second is, is that the cells that are going to be derived from this, the embryonic stem cells that have the potential to be differentiated into all the different cell types, requires the elimination of an embryo. Both of those are fraught with enormous ethical, theological, and political ramifications. So can we get away from that entirely? And the answer is yes. If we take advantage of Yamanaka's work with induced pluripotent stem cells, then what we can do 
is that for any person in this room, we can isolate one of your adult cells by adding the appropriate combination of as few as three or four genes out of the 30,000 some genes that we have. We can take that skin cell and convert it back to an embryonic stem cell state. We don't need eggs. If we don't need embryos, we can basically do it directly. Well, what can we do with this? We can now treat these cells with a variety of regimens. Because the nice thing is, is that these cells can be derived from individuals who suffer from as many as different 40 individual genetic diseases. What it means is, we can do genetic therapy. We can do small molecule drug development. Treat the disease by treating the cells that we isolated from you and then put them back into the individual to hopefully develop new therapies to treat the disease. But here's a staggering implica impl implication of this work. These, embryon these induced pluripotent stem cells that we can isolate from your adults, among the cell types that we can change them back to are gametes. So in fact, we can take these cells and convert them back to sperm if they came from a male. You can convert the cells back to eggs if you take them from a female. In fact, you can have synthetic eggs, synthetic sperm, you can make them, put them together, and in fact, you can generate a viable mouse. So the one thing that I want to leave you with from looking at how the implications of this work are, is that if you've moved away technologically to try and escape the ethical issues that surround the use of eggs and embryos, you find yourself, like many avenues of science, going full circle. You find yourself right back in the same possible situation that you were doing the science to try and evade in the first place. So to close, what I want to leave you with is the following. Is that this technology is new, it's advancing, it's moving further. The beauty of it is that it allows us to basically be the organism of choice to basically treat our own diseases. We become, in fact, our own model system for the development of these new therapies. So it's interesting, everybody knows from the old proverb, the line where it says, physician heal thyself. I would say that now what stem cell research is now providing is a new interpretation on that that would say, patient heal thyself. Your cells are there, they're there for the making, use them, exploit them, but by all means, take advantage of them for the betterment of human future. Thank you.